31st cop I meet is going to be going to get it. And there's a cop in line. Hello and welcome to Shop Talk, where we talk all things Scottsdale Police and answer your questions. Now, here are your hosts, Chief Jeff Walther and Commander Chris Coffey. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the episode 11 of Shop Talk with Chief Jeff Walther and typically Sergeant Kevin Kwan, but uh, Kevin decided to be on the beach this week. So I have my uh, my trusty number two and uh, Commander Chris Coffey with us this week or this month. Excellent. Uh, great month. Busy month since we, uh, since we were here last. And another exceptional, exceptional guest who is, uh, who's agreed to let us drag him on today and in, uh, in, in Dominic Ross. And, and so we're, uh, we'll, we're going to get to Dominic. He's got an amazing, amazing story. Yeah. Um, and, and some great connectivity to the PD now and, and, uh, has really, he's really helped us in a lot of ways. And so uh, we're going to get to get to him, but we're going to kick off Chris with, uh, how we kick off every show and few questions from our uh, from our listeners about police work and and what we do and why we do it some uh, some good questions so I'm excited to, to be here this is my uh, second time but we do have some uh, good uh, yeah, let's get it let's questions. get into those and, and those people who, who send us questions again thank you uh, some some thoughtful questions again this month uh, and uh, excited to answer those for you so uh, chief the first question which uh, again is very uh, appropriate because the number one complaint in the city of Scottsdale <clears throat> is traffic yep so the question is is is, chief when there's an accident why does it take so long to open the streets to drive on again drives me crazy too even though i know i know all the reasons behind it if i'm in my personal vehicle and i'm not at work which is rare uh yeah i i I feel a pain as well so why does it take so long to clear the road multiple factors um one of the biggest factors is if a roadway is closed for a long period of time that means there's either serious injury or sadly, somebody's been killed in that collision. And so those are when the roadways or freeways are closed for lengthy periods of time due to an investigation that has either caused very, very serious injury, the loss of life, and uh, and that has some that potentially has some uh, criminal consequences. So those are that's on the extreme. The shorter version of that is is uh, ultimately if cars are disabled and can't be moved after the collision, then we're waiting for tow trucks to arrive and. The tow industry is having the same problems that we are in the law enforcement industry that everybody's having uh, around the country is staffing shortages. So we're seeing fewer and fewer. We have the trucks available or the tow companies have the trucks available, but they don't always have the drivers. So that's a component of that uh, as well. Another one is, and I put some some responsibility on our citizenry. We try to have this put out this message fairly regularly, is that if you're in a very minor collision uh, and your cars are still uh, fully operable, pull off the road, pull yes. into a parking lot. And I know a lot of people say, well, I, I, the insurance company is going to want to see, you know, a diagram of the collision and that I wasn't at fault. That's okay. We, we, we can see from the debris pattern, if there is any, and eyewitnesses and, and then the, the driver's information that, uh, we will reconstruct that, uh, on, on a template on paper or on the, on the computer. So, uh, get out of the roadway. Oftentimes what you see is, um, secondary collisions because people don't get out of the roadway or worse yet, rubber they, they get out of their cars too. Yeah. They get out of their cars. And then we've had people actually hit creating secondary collisions that are worse than the first collision. But you're right. You rubbernecking. Everybody's rubber necking. interested in, in seeing. Oh my gosh, what happened? Is there any carnage? Right. You know what's going on? Is, is there a white sheet? Right. Uh, pulled over. You know somebody and and uh, and there's a lot of rubbernecking, especially on the freeway. Yes. Uh, that's why you see some major major backups uh, for for very minor collisions or even minor traffic stops. And, so and texting people aren't aren't observing what's happening right. and then they're slamming on the right. brakes and so if it's a minor collision uh go ahead and get out of the roadway pull into a parking lot pull off to it as far off to the side of the road as you can um, please never especially on the freeway or major uh, arterial roadways never get out of your car and stand in the road waiting for the police or between vehicles yes get out of the road uh, but those are typically the reasons uh, it does take a little while the investigation itself uh, can be absent of the vehicles the vehicles can be towed away they can be pulled off to the side of the road um, and the in the officers can or the state troopers can do an investigation with the vehicles gone so uh second question 
Why do some political candidate signs say endorsed by police and fire? Uh, I thought the city was not supposed to show favoritism. Great question. Uh, With it being election season right now, uh, you see the signs are everywhere. And there are a few signs and few candidates that have been endorsed by, say, endorsed by police and fire. So, and this person is right. Uh, The city is not supposed to show favoritism. The police, your police department is um, apolitical. As the chief of police, I cannot come out and say if I endorse a candidate or not. That's not my job. I'm, I'm apolitical. However, there is one little caveat to that, and that is that our employee groups, mm-hmm. and in the case of the Scottsdale Police Department, Fraternal Order of Police, police Lodge Number 35, which is the Scottsdale Lodge, and uh, what we call POSA, POSA or Police Officers of Scottsdale Association, their association members and and uh, um their committee or their their executive boards, they may endorse a candidate based on the candidate's platform. So that's the difference is that the Scottsdale Police Department, the entity uh, right. of the Scottsdale Police Department is not endorsing any candidate, but the membership of our employee groups can endorse uh, certain candidates based on their platform, and they have. Interesting. So you typically what you'll see is uh, if it says police, endorsed by police and fire, Those candidates have come out in a platform uh, and very vocally supportive of uh, public safety, police and fire in Scottsdale. I saw on the news Phoenix police is getting a huge raise and need hundreds of police officers. Does Scottsdale have the same problem? Yes, not to the same extent. You saw Phoenix, the Phoenix numbers their uh, their allocation, their sworn, <clears throat> excuse me, their sworn allocation is thirty one hundred and twenty five police officers. What they currently have is twenty six hundred. That's five hundred and twenty five ish short of where they need to be. Um, and so they took a big swing. There's um, there's a lot going on in the city of Phoenix, and and Phoenix PD is is understaffed right now. Um, and has been for and has while. been for a while, and yeah. it, and it's tough. You know, if you look at some of the numbers. And Chief Jerry Williams and I are friends. You look at some of the numbers. Uh, they lost 274 police officers last year. They hired 71, and I think 58 of those remained by the end of that period. And they really uh, needed to do something to increase their numbers. Yeah, so so for us, and we talked about Phoenix, uh, our numbers are we have uh, 400 sworn, total sworn. We have just under 300 civilian staff or professional staff. Uh, but we have 31 Current today, as of today, we have 31 sworn vacancies. So we're not yet to 10 percent of our of our uh, sworn population, but 31 out of 400 hertz, especially when you look at that doesn't include the people I have on military leave uh, or those people that I have on what we call transitional duty who are injured or ill or out for uh, baby leave or anything like that. So we have 31 current sworn vacancies. But ironically enough, I also have 31 professional staff vacancies. And so when we talk about money and the big swing, this is a huge, huge thing that Phoenix PD did because they did, they're they're about 12% now above, roughly above the Valley average. So that's a, that's a big deal. And so um, our officers look at that and immediately like, like anybody, they say, Hey, when are we going to go to that pay? Right. And so I've been, I've been having some discussions with the city managers and some of our elected officials, uh, the, our city treasurer, our city budget director about where do we go from here, you know, to be most competitive. And right. so that's a lot of discussion going on right now. Uh, in the city and with the PD. Um, and one of the hardest things, the hardest components about that is, is that the typical police officer and city employee can't or does not live in Scottsdale. Right. It's too expensive. Right. When you look at our numbers, we're about 30, the uh, housing prices are about 32% above, you know, our main competitors in Gilbert and Chandler and uh, Tempe and Mesa uh, and, and, and parts of Phoenix and Glendale. Uh, 32% above. So we're, we're looking to address some of those issues. Uh, I would love to go to, and I propose to, to my boss, the city manager to go to that, the same Phoenix pay structure. It's probably just too expensive. It's expensive. That's a, there's a lot of money there. So, yeah. so, but, but there's, there's a lot of room to, um, to do something really positive for our employees. Good. And, and, and again, like you and I've spoken about, about, you know, there's, advantages and disadvantages to, you know, living in the, in the city that you patrol. So, um, 
Yeah, that's an interesting one. I'm glad you brought that up. It's kind of, a, a you know, an asterisk to this discussion is, you know, I started with Scottsdale PD uh, in 1994, so 28 years ago, actually July 5th. Wow. 1994 was my start date. Coming up. <clears throat> yeah. And I will tell you that the the vast, vast, vast majority of my career, 95% plus of my career, I did not want to live in the city where I was a police officer. I wanted my 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 personal life and my professional life to be completely separate. Right. And uh, that was a choice because when, when those two worlds uh, combine, yeah, they, when they collide, sometimes they have disastrous results. Right. I had a personal experience I, I won't share in this particular episode. It, it turned out great, but uh, let's say I ran into a suspect that I had fought with. And fortunately he, um, he saw me with my family on my day off and came to apologize for the knockdown wow. drag out fight we got in while he was on drugs. But you know, that could oh, yeah. have gone the exact opposite. Right. And so we kind of made a, I said I was going to share in another episode and then I shared <laughs> it. But, uh, so we made a conscious decision to, to not live in the city where, where I was a police officer. I live in the city now, but, but uh, I don't have that day to day contact with suspects. And so, but not, we're different. I think our generation of police officers is different. And so now our younger officers, they want to live right. in the community that they, um, that they serve. And so it's, it's been a struggle for us. And we've lost a few officers, a handful of officers to uh, outlying agencies where it's a little cheaper to live, uh, the Gilberts uh, and that, that area. So interesting time because yeah. the, the, the number of officers applications have dwindled significantly across the country for obvious reasons. We, obvious. Could, we could spend the entire show talking Talk, about a national narrative yeah. of law enforcement, but that's uh, for another time. But uh, that kind of gives the, our, our audience a general yeah. idea of what we're talking about. I've, I've always lived in, in the city. And so, and it's, yeah, there's benefits and disadvantages. And so walking into a restaurant when you're off duty and they announce that, you know, the police are here, but you know, you're in, yeah, yeah. you're in shorts and a t-shirt and you're like, okay, <laughs> well, uh, that's some great questions, uh, for the month. Always like the questions. Feel free to ask the hard hitting ones. Uh, I've, I've talked about, uh, in previous podcasts, I love hard questions, things that are going on nationally, locally issue that you potentially had, um, without us getting, I mean, if you have a terrible issue that we, we need to deal with, then internal affairs will be calling you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, please ask those hard questions. I, I'm very transparent in what we talk about here, uh, be it here on the podcast or be it in press conferences or one-on-one, -on -one. um, I want to give you the lowdown of what's really going on here. And if there's a hard question, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the hard answer. We wanted to take a moment to thank you, our listeners, for sending in your questions. Keep them coming. You can send them in via any of our social media pages at Scottsdale PD. The next 15 seconds could save the life of someone you love. There's a deadly drug claiming the lives of Arizona youth at an alarming rate. The drug, counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl. They're cheap, easy to get, and only one pill can kill. Visit TalkNowAZ.com to learn more. Yeah, I just want to welcome Dominic because he has some great stories. Um, and he just brings just such a, a unique perspective for us that has, has really helped us over the last year or so. And so kind of, you know, Dominic, if you don't mind, we kind of, we, we'd like to ask you a few questions and then, sure. and have, you can speak, uh, you know, as long as you want on each of those, I just think you bring a great perspective and a great story Thanks. to, uh, to Scottsdale and Scottsdale PD. If you would kind of give us your background, tell us, uh, where you grew up, how you grew up and, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get in to all that, uh, that business. I am from uh, the East Coast originally. So I grew up born in New York, went to uh, Massachusetts shortly thereafter, then Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland. So I'm an East Coast baby. Uh, when I moved here, everybody kept asking me, say water, <laughs> say sugar. <laughs> I'm like, that's, sugar. that's a weird thing to ask me. <laughs> um, but yeah, just East Coast all my life. Uh, had fun living on a coastal city, but yeah. also in the city city. And that was my experience was playing with the friends, right? hanging out, not trying to, to break any laws, just having a good time. And uh, that's when I was first introduced to the, the, the fantasy of a police officer yeah. is what I grew up because you'd watch TV and sure. you'd see the friendly neighborhood sure. police officer and they'd, they'd give you a lollipop and you'd get a little yeah. sticker and you could play cops and robbers with the cops and, you know. Everything that was the fantasy right. of policing. And then as I got older in my teenage years, uh, it, 
started having the different experience. Right. Like, okay, they don't, maybe don't like me. And of course my mom and my mentors would say, well, make sure you're just not dupe breaking the law. Yeah, Everything will right. be fine. I was like, well, that makes sense, obviously. But what about when I'm just sitting outside? Yeah. Right. Just standing with the buddies. And then it still wasn't, it still had that fantasy nature of policing. Like, surely if, if there's a problem, we'd call them. Right. You know, you call the police because right. that, that's what you do. And those were different experiences as well. But it still wasn't a a hate hate relationship. I didn't feel that. I just fig- figured that if we're out, those cops are going to punish. Right. So that was based. That's how I started my my interactions with policing and started to learn um, what's the survival techniques. Right. Just basic survival. Don't go down that way. Yeah. Be here at a certain time. Do this. Do that. And then I'll be able to survive. And then my friends in Ohio, they would be just like you know, flipping off the cops, and <laughs> throwing rocks. And I'm like, are you trying to be murdered? What's wrong with you? How can you get away with this? And so it was a different experience, but still not understanding if it was a cultural thing, if it was a race thing that just wasn't at the forefront right, of my right. mind. So those were, those were my experiences, my early experiences growing up. It wasn't like a terrible childhood, but it was just my interaction mm-hmm. with policing flavored my understanding and, and my Maturity as I as I grew, I started to see things were um, inequitable. Yeah, in in certain places, you, you know, women were more protected than men. Mm-hmm. The color, different colors, were more protected or less protected, and I guess that's where I started to open my eyes a little bit about just the world. I wasn't laying a a color on it. I wasn't laying a political bend. I wasn't laying, you know, an us against them. It was more like them versus we, if yeah. that makes yeah. sense. It yeah. was, it's just, they're cops, we're citizens, but at least we're not the bad guys. Right. Like, it's not us against them. Right. We're not the bad guys. We just, we're collateral damage. That's interesting too, though. I like that, that your collateral damage. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> that's not what I want to hear as a police <laughs> chief, but, <laughs> but it's such a good... It, it, that experience is, uh, I just think, rings true with a lot of people, especially in, in other areas of the country, too. But then you started to kind of have, uh, you know, more experiences that kind of, I think, just, yeah, I pissed you off. And, and and so can you can you talk about those? Yeah, that was just coming here. Moving here was what I would call my adult years. This is where it's post-college by the way, I audited college. I, I always have to say that. I, I audited. I, I didn't know that you can't just go to a class with your buddy and learn about Renaissance art, right? editing. I, I always wanted to be a filmmaker, so I would just audit classes. And the professor was like, never mind. Go ahead. Whatever. I brought books. I did the whole, I probably have a degree yeah. somewhere, right? but I didn't pay for it. Anyway, is that stealing? I'm in a room full of police officers. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, when I moved here, what was in my th- late twenties is when I moved here, 2001, uh, started a family, the whole thing. And like, this is my grown up time. So yeah. all of that youthful exuberance, my college years, that's, that's over. Um, now it's time to be a grown up, And that's when I started actually counting the amount of times that I was stopped. I think after the third time, I don't know if I told this at, at when I when I speak uh, with the Scottsdale Police Department, but one of my first times getting pulled over or unmarked, unmarked. I guess that's what you unmarked car. And my dumb butt was driving in Phoenix and this lady comes running up to the car like, help me, help me. They're following me. They're chasing me. So, of course, I'm a superhero, obviously, so I'm going to help. <laughs> I'm like, get in where you need to go. What's the problem? And then this car follows me and they have the lights on me and that whole thing. I'm like, what? What is going on? What did you just get me into? What did you right. do? <laughs> and then I, I, I looked at her apparel and I was realizing... I'm so stupid. (laughs) Are you one of those prostitutes that I've heard of in the movies? They had the lights on me. They had, they were standing out the door. They had the walkie talkie. And that's when I used to drive around with a gun. Cause I heard, you know, the, when I moved here, two things, don't be in Scottsdale any time of the day as a black person, don't be ever be in Scottsdale and don't ever be at South Phoenix at night. 
Those were the two instructions. Oh, the third one was, it's pronounced Tempe. And that, those were the three <laughs> things that I was told when I moved here. So anyway, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I have a gun under the seat. This is bad, bad. So they're telling me to get out of the car. And I was just like, yeah, you, you, this is not a good deal. Just follow my lead. Just, you know, do, do whatever they need to say. But what, what an embarrassing moment this is going to be for me. And I was trying to be helpful. So naive. I started noticing that they were calling out things and giving me commands to do. And then it just hit me. I was like, I don't see any lights on this car, anything that would signify policing in any way. And they, they, they look like they could be undercover, but where's the, the hiding behind the car? I was like, are you guys cops? And they're like, I said, get over here. Give me the thing. You guys got, what's the deal? What's going on? I'm going to pull out my gun. And if you guys don't show me some ID, I'm going to start shooting. Oh boy. <laughs> they're like, don't you reach for anything? Don't you Bravado, stupidity. But <laughs> I was starting to feel like these aren't really cops. These, these, they were following her. So I pull out my gun and, oh. the, and then they get in the car and peel out and take off. No. So that wasn't my first interaction with police, but that's when I started thinking, man, this is a really strange area. They were faking it. I think they were um, yeah. college kids having a goof following this lady around. Wow. And then that was like my first thought process was, okay, if those were police, I'd be dead right now. Yeah. What are you thinking? Yeah. What yeah. are you doing? Why was I doing that? It didn't taint my, it didn't color the way I thought about policing, but it was just like, man, I could be really fooled. I really need to pay attention to the things that I do because I may be able to get away with that in a different city, but this is Arizona in my mind. I, I have to be aware of where I am and what I do. And so I stopped carrying a gun and, you know, did my family thing. But, but I think some of that had me on edge. The more I was thinking about right, what we talked, right. it had me on edge. Just be prepared. Just make sure that you don't do stupid things as a youth. So be respectful, be courteous, but also be cautious. So the next couple of interactions I had, is like, I haven't I done everything right? Mm -hmm. I, I made sure that I'm doing everything right. And I would still get the condescension. And then I think the third or fourth interaction with police officers, when they pulled out a gun, and then I started paying attention. That's when I started counting. Okay, this is not funny. This isn't just a, uh, a fix-it ticket or, by the way, I've never had a ticket. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. bring up to tell our audience that you've never been arrested. Never no, been arrested. Never gotten a ticket. Never. And, you know, you put your insurance and, and all your documents in your visor. I have you, to adapt. Because you don't want to be reaching for anything. That 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 incident flavored it. Cause I don't want to be reaching under my seat. Right. I don't want to be going into the stuff. Cause the couple of the interactions that I had, the second, maybe third, fourth was really, um, you told me to reach for my credentials. I did a thing. I turn around, you have a gun in the back of my head. That's not great. That's not cool. Yeah. What's going on with the Phoenix or Mesa or Gilbert <clears throat> or any of the places that I would travel. It started to become, uh, with black people, they had a movie called The Green Book. I don't know if you knew about this movie, but it, back in the day, black people used to have a traveler's guide. So when you were traveling interstate, you knew which places were sundown towns. And sundown town is a place where you better not be black and in this town at night. They had the hotels, the safe places, the wow. safe routes that you could travel wow. interstate from the east to the west and back and forth so that you knew where the safe havens were. And you also knew where the dangerous places like sundown towns. This is something that's culturally we right. all knew about about that. But of course, we would always say it's the at that time the 20th century. Nobody's gonna right. But that's kind of been the experience that we have. You you're supposed to know where to go, where to be, what time, what's safe and what's not. So just in in that understanding, I thought, okay, I, I'm going to be doing the things that I need to do, but that's still not going to be good enough. So now I know because a gun was pulled up that I need to put my credentials in the visor. I need to put my hands on the wheel. I used to put my hands out the driver's side window a lot, but then it got a little awkward. I need you to reach for your, ID, <laughs> your driver's license. I'm not moving. But, now, but I think now is now I think you've gotten married. You have a child. Yeah, two so, kids. Yeah. So yeah. your thought process is. Now it goes into protecting them. Right. You know, just I got to make sure that they that they know because they haven't had that. My wife and my daughter from like the Pacific Northwest. Right. They've never had the worst interaction they had is with a deer. 
You know, <laughs> they, they don't go through that type of stuff. And my son was born in Scottsdale. Right. You know, so he doesn't know. He didn't grow up. He'd right. hear the stories. And I try to make sure that he that I didn't I didn't taint his uh, view of policing in America. But they invented this thing called YouTube. So uh-huh. back in the day, they didn't really monitor it. Right. right. So you could see, you know, black people get killed all the time. And there's a different department. So I try to balance that with like, not all cops are like that. And then he would, he would want to know what my experience was. And I would tell him age appropriate stories, you know, so watch out and don't do this. And, but I had to teach him that that as he ages in the minds of some people, uh, his 12 year old self is a grown, full grown man in the minds of people. It's a little bias. So they they could look at him as if he's a grown up and treat him right. like he's a grown up. So I'd had to teach him certain things that he needs to do to stay alive. And some of my friends in different races, different places, they're like, that's crazy. I've never taught, I've taught them not to drink and drive, but I've never told them how to stay alive just by right. being. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was the basics of how I had to, the, the long circuit of that was look, teaching myself ways that I need to survive in a different place. No gun, um, put my credentials up right. where everything can be visible. No tint, not any tint. And, and in Arizona, Arizona, you gotta have tint, but <clears throat> just a little bit of tint yeah. is, is enough or, um, you know, citizens don't know. We don't know the dif- real difference between RAS, PC. We, we don't know any of that stuff. You watch a video and we think we know. Because we've got a Google degree, um, <laughs> but, like but, we, but we don't know for sure what what we can and cannot do. Nobody right. knows the traffic right. laws other than a speed limit, and that's it. Like you said, traffic. Everybody wants to watch uh, what drive. Like the, go, the road is clear. Right, right. We all have <laughs> iPhones. They're telling us it's clear, but the things that people do, I just don't do anymore. Right. So ultimately, you had about thirty experiences with law enforcement uh, in Arizona, in Arizona Mm -hmm. that were not good. Yeah. It was uh, everything from, like I said, just reaching for my credentials told to do something. You reach for your license registration, proof of insurance, turn back around. There's a gun. And it's like, what are you doing? You drop, you know, I don't know. I'm keeping it very PG 13. So I want everyone to be proud of me. (laughs) Let's say I, I, had the feeling of relieving myself when that happens. And I've had so many guns pointed at me, bad guys, good guys, that it still isn't normal Mm -hmm. uh, to me, but to have the good guys do that um, in this state more often than not starts to, well, for me, it just started to weigh on my soul. I started to to get that bitter taste in my mouth whenever there was a police interaction and then anybody that treated police officers well, or they would go on the news and be like, we back the blue. To me, that be, became a point of contention because I'm like, you're, you're just a bootlicker. You, you'll never understand what it's like. And is it just because I'm black or is it because I'm a man or is it because I'm a black man? It's like, what's going on? It's not anything unusual because I've always been treated like this, but now as an adult and a parent, I'm starting to become much more protective mm-hmm. of myself mm-hmm. and my family. And uh, then, of course, you see all of this stuff. For me, I, I think I talked about this in one of the uh, post-academy things, that none of this is new to me. Everything that everyone's seeing on the news and on YouTube, none of that is unusual to me, which most Scottsdale Police Department, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Isn't it ramping up? Isn't it getting more vitriol on both sides? And I'm like, nope, this is exactly how I remembered it. We just didn't film it in mm-hmm. the 80s. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until Rodney King or whatever, right. until things started getting seen like that. But this is the norm. Anyway, um, stopped more than I think m- most people have been stopped. My 30 times, people don't. They don't understand that. They keep thinking, some of my friends and family, they're like, well, you must be speeding a lot. No, I drive like a grandma. I absolutely make sure that it's like, if I see my rate, my uh, speedometer going to 68, I'm slowing down. I drive in the slow lane. 
Uh, so, side note, there is no slow lane and fast lane. I just want people to know that. Just to everybody that's listening to it, slow lane, lane so-called, is where you can drive the speed limit. All right. God bless But in those 30 action, uh, interactions, so never got a ticket. I've never had a ticket. Never I've, I've never, ever had a ticket. Right. Whatever infraction I was doing, like a wide left, it was just caused to stop me with all of the lights. And it's a wide left in a Jeep that didn't have hydraulics, uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. the uh, power steering. But why would that necessitate guns being drawn? I never could wrap my head around, why does that need to have guns drawn? Why do I need to be um, asked to get out of my car and then pushed up against the hot roof um, of my car? It's Arizona. Why did that, why did anything that I do, if it's not ticketable and not arrestable, right? why did that necessitate me being roughed up Mm -hmm. none of the things that one could prove but i always thought well sorely somebody's recording this like it's got to be recorded somewhere i didn't think about it until much later on that isn't there a record of it in a way that i could prove it and then sometimes it would become like i don't even i don't want to see that again because not not to um lessen PTSD, but it started to feel a little bit, at least like PTSD. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to see my assault happen again. You know, I don't want to see that. I don't want to know about it. I just want to go and live my life. I don't want to be an advocate, an activist. I just want to be a parent and a husband, make some movies, teach some Bible. That's all I want to do. But uh, those, those 30 times they would increasingly it, it would be kind of yo-yo, like one interaction would just be a condescending police officer. Mm-hmm. Like, don't bother me. I'm doing real work. It's like, well, I'm just going to ask you a question, but never mind. All the way to all he has to do is pull that trigger. And then my, my, my whole world has changed because I'm going to be seeing angels. Yeah. My family, that was the hard mm-hmm. part is what my family would go through. If I were taken out like that, hard to wrap my mind around it. And then so out of each one of those 30 incidences, it really was the last one that was what I, I don't even jokingly say this. I feel like it turned me into a a prejudiced racist because the race that I was against was, were blue, blue lives. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody in that uniform now, (laughs) now you are an enemy to me. I have reason. I have cause you are an enemy right. to me just because you got up and suited up right and the color was blue it's regardless absolutely. of the skin color of the officer the color was blue always it yep. was absolutely that and if i saw a black police officer you're blue right you will back up your friends you are completely uh we use a phrase called uncle tom in it or you you just follow your white counterparts into stuff and you are Almost like a, these aren't, these aren't things that I would say out loud, but they were definitely within my heart upon, you mm-hmm. know, retrospection and introspection that they were race traders. I mean, the, the, the thoughts that I had, <laughs> you could find on any racist website saying the same things that I was feeling inside. You don't, you don't do anything for community. You will kill us. You'll rape us. You will take our money. Like these are the things that you hear in birth of the nation, you know, just that, that language, that thought process. And I was attributing that to police officers. And and I know that it doesn't, it's not an instant thing. It has to take time that, that getting beat down Mm -hmm. mentally and not guarding my own brain, you know, taking responsibility for how my behavior was not just laying it all at the cop, all at the feet of police officers. There's, 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 I did have experiences, but what did I do with it? Right. So what I did with it, unfortunately, was after my 30th stop with just an angry, 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 angry police officer, I determined in my heart and soul that the next police officer that I met was going to get it somehow. Um, If that meant getting a gun in my heart, I know I didn't say this, but I would go by those gun shops and be like, other than the Confederate flag, they might be able to give me an affordable <laughs> weapon just to protect myself. Cause right. my thought process was like, well, if someone's doing something unjustifiable, it doesn't matter what they look like. I should be able to fight back. Well, you know, guns aren't cheap, but maybe they'll get a, a fist. Maybe I'll fight. You know how that's going to end up. I don't know of any police officer that would allow themselves to just get into a tussle 
Right. And then shake hands afterwards. Be like, right. good fight, bro. Right. right. Um, that's not going to end well. And why am I become now someone who is everything that they said I was or assumed I was, I'm going to be that violent interaction. Right. At the least, they're going to get a good tongue lashing. You right. know, I'm going yeah. to yell and say some expletives. <laughs> it will be a rated R experience. And then? And then, um, the after, after feeling that and knowing that that's what I was going to do, come to Scottsdale for a basic meeting. I said, the 31st cop I meet is going to be going to get it. And there's a cop in line. Oh, God. At the coffee shop. At the coffee shop. I'm just trying to have a business meeting. And there's a <laughs> black gentleman that bought this police officer some some uh, a lunch. He said, "Good job, back to blue." And I'm looking at him like Ugh. he was ahead of you. So the so the cop was ahead of you. The cop was ahead of me. And so was the other black patron. The black patron had purchased the guy's okay. the cop's lunch, and I'm just like, "Oh, you fool! You're a bootlicker. <laughs> you have no idea. You just haven't been treated poorly enough. Wait till you're really black like me, because obviously, I'm a true black. Um, stupid, idiotic." But I'm trying not to even look at this cop. I, I don't want to look at him. I got my hands in my pocket. Or do I put my hands in my pocket or do I keep my hands out of my, that's how I live. Because mm -hmm. I don't want them thinking, you know, because I've had those experiences as well. It's like, I'm just walking down the street, get your hands out of your pocket. It's 30 degrees out. What are you talking, you know, whatever. So I'm, that's what I'm thinking about instead of my delicious, delicious lemonade. I'm thinking about how do I behave because there's a police officer who, in my mind, could take my life or take my liberty. So I'm trying to avoid looking at him and he turns around this cop and says, Hey, do you want something? And all I heard was, you know, I'm going to do something bad to you. Yeah. If you give me the eyeball. Um, and my mind, I, I thought this is the time that I'm going to react poorly, but my heart was so broken. My soul was so crushed. I literally just went, what, what did you say? What do you want? I can't even sit in, in my mind. I can't even stand in a line to get a cookie without cops messing with me. And he said, uh, I was asking if you wanted a lemonade because the guy, be, I want to cry again because the guy in front of me bought my lunch and I wanted to pay it forward. That's the 31st cop I met. Wow. Scottsdale PD and just melted all the hate, vitriol, <clears throat> insanity, PTSD, anything that I had toward police officers melted in that one gesture. It still fascinates me to this day because mm -hmm. I believe in God and I believe that God was just like, well, I'm not going to let you go out like that. I'm not going to let you harm someone else. I'm going to make a way that you see something not to be hyperbolic, but a miracle. Mm -hmm. I'm going to save your life. And it's going to be through the hands and the life of somebody that our lives have gone like this. And we just met here in Scottsdale. And by the way, just so for emphasis, not to wax anybody's surfboard, but I have never been poorly treated by the Scottsdale Police Department. Every other city, municipality, county, township in Arizona, I've been pulled over. Those 30 times have been all over, but right. not once <clears throat> in Scottsdale. And that was just, okay, surely this cop, he's just a unicorn. He's just that, <laughs> one, that one cop out of a billion gazillion. And he was like, he gave me his card. He said, obviously you've been through some stuff because it must have shown. Right, right. <laughs> you've been through some stuff. If you want to talk, I'm available. I said, like, man, don't mess with me because I'm, I'm a very vulnerable point right now. <laughs> don't mess with me. <laughs> if you want to talk, I want to as well. And then he said, absolutely. And we'd been meeting for coffee for two years now. Yeah. We met other police officers, Scottsdale police officers. Right. And I was like, it's not just that guy. Yeah. That's the weirdest thing for me. I still don't understand how you all do it in Scottsdale, but. So for our, our, for our audience, the 31st police officer to count you, that you came in contact with yep. is Sergeant Matt Rigberg. Yeah. I didn't want to out him. I yeah, didn't want to. Sergeant Matt oh, no, Rigberg. We need to, we, we need to, we need to. I'm trying to keep it secret. So yeah, right. yeah. You know him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Sergeant Matt Rigberg's a, as a Phenomenal. great guy, great representative of the Scottsdale police department. But I, I really, I really like how he, not only did he pay it forward from the other patron who just, there's irony here, yeah. you know, that who also happened to be uh, black. Uh, and, and then he, he took that a step further, but you were that the willingness for you to say, oh, yeah, all right, I'll, yeah. Be, I'll meet with you. I'll sit down and talk. Yeah. And that forged the relationship. But I, I thought Matt did, you know, wound up doing an amazing job because 
I think through those conversations, you're like, oh, this, you know, this is a unicorn. No, no, let me, let me introduce you to these other people. Literally said that. Yeah. It's like, no, it's not, it's, it's not that we, we have a different um, culture. culture here. And I'm, and I, you know, trying to pull stuff out of them a little bit. Cause I'm still waiting. I'm always waiting for that one cop. I'm going to meet one of his cops, right? his buddies, his chief, his commander. And then it'll, then he'll be able to see it too. I'll be like, see, he hates me. You were the only guy. And in two and a half years, that still has not happened. I've met some jerks on the SPD. I'm yeah. just saying oh, yeah. that. We ha- we oh, yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Every department has their shares. Not every, every department. But it's like somebody mentioned that movie Crash, yeah, where right. it's the worst cop in the world. And yeah. at the end of it, he still saves somebody yeah, because yeah. it's innate in him. Yeah. And I, I have met that in no other department. I'm not trying to crap on any of your friends out there, okay? If you're a cop, I just haven't met you. But in SPD, it just is a culture of accountability, integrity. What else did the chief write down for me to say? <laughs> I have no notes. This is just from the heart. Accountability, integrity, and and I don't know what that third thing is, but I keep trying to find it yeah. if there's a third thing. Because how can you hire so many good cops? How do you How are you finding them with lateral moves and people just coming out of the academy? How is that, how is that culture able to sustain yeah, yeah. here? Interestingly enough, we talk about culture, and one of the things I've been talking about a lot lately uh, since I came back as the chief um, is that what is what is culture, right? Mm. We talk a lot about, I think, in in business and in in policing, we talk about culture. Well, well, we talk about a lot here and push a lot that culture is really about a standard, right? You set a standard, but then you have to have the expectations to that your your employees achieve that standard. So you have that standard followed by expectations, followed by accountability. And so all three of you need all three of those. It does you no good if you have standards and expectations, but no accountability to achieve those standards. It takes it's no good if you have a standard, but no expectation to achieve mm-hmm. those standards. Those three things, I think, just make us better. Not always. And there are going to be listeners who will say, well, I met a Scottsdale cop on a traffic stop who clearly was having a bad day and was a jerk. And so, but we address those. We have conversation mm-hmm. about those. We, ad- we address the employee when we get those complaints. So that's what I found, find fascinating. The other thing that I find, there's just complete irony in some of the, in some of what you said earlier in the conversation is that when you, when you came to Arizona, they told you three things. <laughs> Don't go to South Phoenix at night. Right. Uh, Tempe is Tempe. Yeah. It's not Tempe or it's not Temp. Tempe. It's, right. It's Tempe. It's Tempe. <laughs> but the most important thing for me listening to your story is that you were told, don't go to Scottsdale at any time during the day. No time. Which don't ever go there. Which now, and, and that's a, that's a, I will, I will tell you that I believe that that's a decades, decades old uh, uh, notion or thought process. Um, since we have the lion's share of, of, of clubs and entertainment in, in, in the Valley here in Scottsdale, but it just, I just think it just strengthens or, or makes your, your experience so much more profound because the place you were told not to go at all you meet. is the place that's, that it has been most welcoming to you. Yeah. And South Phoenix, I made a music video there and all the right. gangs just welcomed me. So yeah. the two places, <laughs> right. and I still stay Tempe. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's been bananas. I'm going to make this uneditable, but uh, I just have to keep saying that the more I talk to you, you guys <laughs> about, you say accountability, integrity, culture. And I was like, okay, maybe that's the linchpin that why this department is so different. But then I hear other departments all over the country talking about the same thing. So now I'm back to where I started to where, nope, if there's something particularly unique about right. the Scottsdale Police Department. Again, not to wax a surfboard. I just got to speak honestly. If I thought you guys were awful, I probably wouldn't be invited here, but I would speak honestly on it. So at right. least you have it on record that right. here's where you guys screw up. Now let's see if you have accountability and transparency because I'm telling you yeah. when you screwed up. But I see the same talk all over the country. Sure. And but yet they still have the same problems. They still go through the same interactions with the community. 
you guys are saying one of the worst problems you have is traffic. Right. It's not like you don't have body and, and, and drug trafficking in this place. Right, we do. It's not that you don't have meth and crime and people yeah. stealing and robbing, but the biggest thing that you probably, that the citizenry at least the has citizens. to deal with is traffic. Right. Do you hear yourselves? Like that's fascinating to me that you have, you have enough relationship with the community right. and the people and the businesses that that's the thing that they would complain about the most, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not, hey, your officers are beating us up on a record level. Right. Right. You don't deal with that. And right. anything that you deal with, it goes national. There's like one or two things that go national and it gets handled immediately. Right. And it's a non-story mm -hmm. now. Right. Where other places are still dealing with the effects of things that they did decades and yesterday. Right. And I, that's just, I think that's a great observation because I, I point out, hey, this is not Mayberry. Right. This is not right. uh, this is not a town of, uh, of 50 or 75 people. This right. is 250,000 residents and 11 million visitors and mm -hmm. 185 square miles and the lion's share of, enter, you know, nighttime entertainment on the weekends and yes. major, major special events, international, and national special events. But, you know, it, it's you don't see the, you know, a lot of the things here that you see where there are problems elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think a component of that, and, and I hope your story proves some of that out is that in policing, policing is difficult all, all around the country. It's, it's very difficult, but I think it's made more difficult when a police department sees itself as above the community. Mm -hmm. So when you see yourself as above the community, uh, it's not a stretch then to one day see yourself as an occupying army. And when you see yourself as an occupying army, then that's when real trouble starts to happen in a, in a police department. Not that all the officers in any of those uh, departments are all bad. It's just when there's a philosophy like that, it starts the it's, it starts to be very problematic between police and community relationships. And in Scottsdale, we don't see ourselves that way. We see ourselves as part of the community. We just happen to choose a specialization in law enforcement. And we see ourselves as part of that community. And that's a mantra that I push, that the executive team, that the officers push, that their professional staff push day in and day out. Now, you're right. We've had a couple national news stories. Are we perfect? No. But when we make a mistake, we're on it. So that's, I think that's the difference. We see ourselves as part of the community. And, and so when Sergeant Matt Rigberg saw you and somebody had paid for his, his meal, he thought, well, I'm, I'm part of the community. And who's the guy behind me? I want to pay it forward to that. And uh, I think he needed that. And I think you needed that. Oh yeah, definitely. The more we talked, I found out that he, that he needed that interaction because he felt that he was ignorant on those things. He'd never heard the stories that I told. Yeah. He never heard it. It was foreign to him. And the stories that he told me about the community <laughs> was foreign to, to me. I couldn't believe it. And one of the, one of the things I want to say be, before, again, in my constant quest to make this uneditable, <laughs> um, I'm trying to make sure, and you guys, chief commander, you haven't told me to say this, but one of the things that I'm striving for, if, if, if this place is so unique and it's a unicorn, but the, it's because of the things that you say, I'm trying to, whoever listens to this, I'm hoping that, uh, anybody that's thinking about becoming a police officer or thinking about transitioning into a different place, like you said about my hope and my prayer is that you could stay here or join up in Scottsdale Police Department. If you want to have a good career and there's place for promotion and there's, there's a great community interaction and you're not going to get hated nationally, this department would be the place to come mm -hmm. to. If you wanted to be LEO because you want to help people and have a pension, why can't this be the place right. if you really just want to be LEO? There's something unique about the Scottsdale Police Department. And if you want to be a part of that and really want to showcase your skills, and, <laughs> and they didn't ask me to say this, That's I have right. no papers in front of me. I don't care if anybody think whatever they think. I just know that there's, there's something unique here. And uh, I think people can benefit, citizens and LEO can benefit from Whatever you guys are doing yeah. here, it's it's working. Thanks, yeah. and Chris, you know, uh, speak to where we where we've gone from from there. I yeah. mean, the original meeting, you know, with with Dominic and, and Sergeant Rigberg. But uh, why don't you talk to the group, to the audience about where now how we've we've really leveraged Dominic and his amazing story uh, for some of our our some of the you know internal to the organization. Right. So it's interesting when when you talk about your conversation with Sergeant Rigberg and how he was 
naive to some of your stories. Then when I heard your story, I'm like, wow, I'm like, you get, you got to tell your story. You got to tell your experiences. So uh, we introduced you to our post Academy, which is a group of officers that have recently graduated the Academy and then they come, it's a regional Academy and they come back here. And again, you shared your story and, and a lot of them were also naive because they're like, what do you, what do you mean that, you know, you were treated like that? I mean, that's, it's not what we're taught. That's not what we do. And uh, so that was so successful. Then we uh, had you talk to our field training officers. Our goal was, you know, to again, have them understand, you know, a different view. Having, you know, our trainers who then teach our impressionable, you know, officers, new officers, they needed to hear that. And then you've uh, spoken to um, our lieutenants, our watch commanders, and our executive team. So we've... And then the icing on the cake <laughs> of all of this was then we presented Dominic yes. with, with, you know, when we think you're really cool and you've done great things for us and you've right. spent hours of your own time that we didn't pay for uh, <laughs> to help train our folks. Right. We present you with the pinnacle, a Scottsdale PD plaque of appreciation. And, and challenge coin. <laughs> the challenge coin. I got a challenge coin. I can carry that with me. Doesn't get any better than that. One of the things that I was really... Uh, hoping for was in one of those first initial meetings with our post academy, I invited your family to come and, you know, for your son to come and see that, you know, again, police officers are the good guys and that, you know, we are here to help. And so he's trying to make me cry again because that was a big deal for my son to be able to see. Yes. That um, there's a police force, law enforcement agents, who care much more about people than at times even a promotion, Mm -hmm, which is, again, completely unicorn. Strange. You don't have to, this all started with a cup of coffee. I'm not supposed to be teaching people and telling my story. (laughs) And now I'm doing a podcast with the chief of police. I just want everybody (laughs) to know how strange it's just supposed to be a cup of coffee. So it's very surreal because you and I've talked about it that, you know, in your first meetings with other Scottsdale police officers with Sergeant Rigberg, your family and friends were scared for you. Terrified. And so even when you came to our training unit and I gave you a tour with your family, they were still afraid for you that now you're in our training unit. So, yeah. but that's what we do. We, we open our arms. So was today like, you're going to go do a podcast with the police chief? <laughs> Should we put a tracking device on you? Right. <laughs> it's, it's in my calendar. Now it's okay. But the first couple of meetings, right. some of my family is like, oh, yeah, sure. You just go into the police department. It'll be fine. The rest of them are just like, they're setting you up, man. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just something going to go down. <laughs> don't don't reach for anything. Just scared, like scared that it was really going to go bad because I was going into the lion's den. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's crazy, right? It's, we think it's crazy, but t- that that's, I mean, that's a lived experience. It's for a lived you, experience. So, it's a real yep. concern. Which is why we, I, wanted to, you know, I wanted to have you on. Actually, uh, I always give a shout out to my wife. My wife is always telling me about, Hey, here's who you need to have next on the podcast. And I, 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 I think the last two prior to Dominic were like, Hey, you need to have, uh, you know, Aiden Leone on, right. he, he hiked the Pacific crest trail. You need to have, uh, you know, Alex Sachs on right. because she's, she's right. got a silver medal. <laughs> she's like the Dominic story, the Dominic story you told me about, you got to have him on that. I'm like, okay, I think he's going to wear him on next. And, and I, and I agree when you told me that I go, your wife is the smartest person. Yeah, she, I, 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 I told her the other day, I said, Hey, uh, have available for me the, the next name that you right. want for, uh, for the, for the podcast. But she's basically producing the show. She's producing right. the show, but honestly, Dominic, and we're going to get into our fun questions here. Um, I just, your story, um, it really moves me every time that I listen to it and get different, different, uh, you know, information from it every time. And, and it just speaks to why I got into this profession 28 years ago and, uh, and kudos to Matt Rigberg and, and commander Regan and, and then commander coffee and everybody who's gotten involved in this and really, um, wanted to share how important that one interaction is. And sometimes we only get the opportunity once to make that interaction. And if that benefits you and your life and your family, Sergeant Rigberg's life, his family moving forward, because we'll all eventually, uh, Sergeant Rigberg is retiring next month. Yeah. And, and so what, a, what an amazing opportunity uh, we have every day to show one another that um, 
we're all living the same human experience. There, there are different there are different paths to take in this human experience, but they all wind up in the same place. And that's a connectivity between people that if we don't have, we're going to fail alone instead of really succeeding together. And your story is about succeeding together. And that's why I want to go to the, to the mountaintop and, and talk about your experience and have you stand next to me in that experience. Because when we stand next to each other and, and share that human experience we're not going to fight about it. We're going to recognize how we're the same. And if we don't recognize we're the same in this country, we're going to fail miserably. So I'm just so thankful for you being here. Thank you. That's a wrap for this episode with Dominic Ross and his incredible story. Let's finish out this episode with Commander Coffee and some for reals questions. All right, let's, uh, Chris, let's get into the fun questions. What is the one thing that you absolutely need to do in the morning? Absolutely need to do in the morning. Um, I, I need to make sure that I am actually alive. <laughs> What's that thing? You, you check the obituary if you're, if you're not in it. Uh, for me, uh, honestly, and my wife uh, uh, got on me about this this morning. I, I absolutely need to do is kiss her goodbye in the morning. Yes. If I start to walk out, she's like, excuse you, because mm. <laughs> I carry a gun. Yeah. And I wear a uniform. And right. even though I'm not on the road doing cool things anymore, uh, sadly, I'm a target. And so uh, <laughs> maybe even from my own employees, you never know. Uh, but anyway, so I have to kiss her. I have to kiss her goodbye. That just went wow. dark, but and it, also it, romantic. It, it, right. Exactly. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Wow. It's a little, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a little sweet and a little salty at the same time. <laughs> Would you want a yacht or a lake house? That's. For me, I believe because my wife needs to be by the water, I have to have both. Right. So I'm mm. going. I'm going to be broke. Mm. So right. uh, that's yeah. why I got to get sell some of these movies. But I have. She needs the water. I am used. I'm not used to waving like that right. or hearing n- not noise. Right. It took me about uh, two months to fall asleep in this in this state because I wow. I lived in Mesa and it was crickets. I right. Think. Oh, mm. this is too quiet. Lake house. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a fan of big bodies of water. Right. Yeah. I do a lake house. Big, day. scary things under the water. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I like lake house. Who would you like to meet and have dinner with? Wow. Mm. The actor, Gary Sinise. Oh. You remember? Yeah. Lieutenant Dan. Lieutenant Dan. Dan. Sure. <laughs> so Gary Sinise. And, and why? Uh, he is, and we're talking about unique individuals or unicorns or people who, who make a difference. Gary Sinise uh, has dedicated his lives to wounded warriors, our, our servicemen and women. Yes. And, you know, I, for those listeners who don't know, my, my oldest son is a former Army Ranger. My son-in-law is a former Army Ranger. That's how I got it as a son-in-law. Um, best friend my oldest son's best friend in his unit uh first ranger battalion 75th ranger regiment and so gary um despite all of his acting accolades and all that he he is absolutely committed to our men and women uh in uniform and those in particular who've been uh who've been wounded in in combat and so uh, i'd love to meet him and have dinner with him and talk about service nice Hmm. in the movie business i've been able to meet a lot of the people that he's talking about and have actual dinners with these folks so that that hasn't been because i know i can have a right. dinner with with folks like that but you know who i'd like to meet and have dinner with would be matt rigberg right like i'd always because that was a, a big thing <clears throat> life leading up to that and then life after that that's what I'd like to, because I get to see my kids all the time. Right. Yeah, yeah. I already had meals with my mom and but rest yeah. in peace. But that was such a defining moment in my world, or, or it, and it left such an indelible impression. I'd like to do that. That's great. You know, yeah. thankful for him. Dominic, again. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Great, uh, great conversation. Uh, as always, to our listeners, uh, thanks for everything that you do. Thanks for listening, and remember that every day offers each of us the opportunity. Uh, to excel and to be more in the service of each other. So if we just uh, if we just strive for that every day, I think we're going to have more experiences like uh, Sergeant Rigberg and Dominic had with one another. So uh, take that opportunity to be more, uh, be safe, take care of each other, and we'll see you next month. Thanks for listening to Shop Talk Episode 11. We'd love to hear from you. 
You can send your comments or questions to us on any of our social pages. You will find us at Scottsdale PD on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. We look forward to bringing you a new episode next month. Until then, remember to be more.